On this Sunday prior to November the 11th, we observe today a time of remembrance to honor the sacrifices made by many over many years in the quest for justice, freedom, and peace. And uh, as you're coming to the sanctuary today, you'll notice the poppies and the other decorations that remind us of this time of year. And I want to thank those who uh, decorated. I also want to just take a moment now, as I'm welcoming you to, before I forget, to acknowledge that it's been a custom many years for you to come forward and place your poppies on the wreath as part of our remembrance. But Remembrance Day is still six days away, nearly a week. So this year I'm inviting you to keep your poppy as the reminder that it needs to be for the coming days. So that uh, if you attend the Cenotaph service on Remembrance Day, you can place it there before you leave. And uh, today we won't have the placing of the poppies. I want to welcome those of you who are gathered here in the sanctuary of Scottsburg United Church. And of course, a warm welcome to those of you who are joining us in worship from your home for our online service. I am the Reverend Jim Weber Cook, and I am in ministry with the people of Salt Springs, Scottsburg, and Lionsbrook Pastoral Charge of the United Church of Canada. And uh, today I am joined in worship uh, of, by many offering their gifts, including our organist, Stuart Monroe. Our candle lighter will be Nora McDonald. Ian McCara will lay the wreath for our remembering. And Carol Bailey will read in Flanders Fields. Scripture reader today is Jack Cox, and Anne uh, Russell is doing double duty as soloist and Minute for Mission presenter. And of course, our videographer is Christine McKenzie, and all of those folks and you are joined by the singers of the Scottsburg Lions Brook United Church Choir, who will lead us in singing. Immediately following today's service, I'm going to invite you to do something a little different and a little special. We're going to dedicate very briefly a new tree that's been planted in the front yard. And the suggestion was made that wouldn't it be neat if, as that tree is growing each year, we have a photograph of those gathered around the time of that anniversary. So we'll have a very brief dedication prayer and we welcome all of you, Scottsboro and Lionsburg people, to gather um, around that little tree for a photo, a group photo. It won't take long. And then you can come inside again and go downstairs because it is Cookie Sunday. So you can come back in and enjoy some treats, and we give thanks for those who are offering these gifts of hospitality. Today is also Fun Script Sunday, the first Sunday of each month, and uh, you're welcome to share your orders with Hilton or with Susan. Is Susan here? Oh, there she is. I thought I saw her. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, or you can also email them, and their contact info is in the bulletin. Please note that I will be on continuing education leave coming up this week, beginning on Wednesday. Um, there are a number of meetings scheduled for Tuesday, so that's why I'm starting that week of continuing education on Wednesday. And um, don't believe what your bulletin says. It says that I'll be coming back to work on the following Wednesday, the 15th, but I just figured out this morning we have a session meeting on the night of the 14th, which I didn't have in my book. So. I'll be back to work on the evening of the 14th with all the elders um, who will be meeting that night, not this Tuesday, the following Tuesday, in Salt Springs at 7. And please note that if you have a, an emergency, a pastoral emergency, or need for a minister, arrangements have been made for our pastoral charge that Reverend Mary Beth Moriarty of Picta United will cover and will be available to you, and her numbers are in your bulletin today. This fall, our session, in relation to this, made a decision to return to a former practice and protocol. We had stopped it during COVID, but as of now, once again, whenever your minister, your ministry personnel, is on study leave or holidays, the session has decided we'll have one service on that Sunday morning for the pastoral charge. And so next week, please note that it is a combined service of the pastoral charge in Salt Springs at St. Luke's at 9.15 in the morning, which is their regular time. So those of you on this part of our charge who wish you had an early service, so you could have lots more of the day ahead of you, you get to enjoy that next week. And we are thankful that Reverend Kelly Thompson will be our worship leader uh, next Sunday at Salt Springs. Jeff Gunn is co-chair of the Board of Managers of this congregation. Jeff has a word. Morning. Uh, on behalf
behalf of the Scotsman Board of Managers, I would like to uh, just say a few words about yesterday's uh, annual fall pancake breakfast. Uh, we served, I just got word this morning from Carolyn that we served uh, 160 people, so that was, we were really, really pleased. We came very, very close to, to selling out. I uh, just want to thank uh, all, all those who donated, who helped serve, who helped do dishes, um, and, and provided the gift of music. We were really pleased with the turnout, and for those of you that came out and also supported, supported us. It makes it much easier to keep the lights on and the heat on uh, um, in this church uh, with, with these fundraisers. So again, I would like to thank, on behalf of the board of managers, everyone who contributed. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. And yesterday there were numerous comments about what a good crew of workers out there and in the front of the house. And when we looked around, we thought, yeah, pretty much all of the congregation are here today <laughs> pitching in. So, uh, wonderful effort. Please note the ECW from Lionsbrook have a thank you about their Bakeless Bake Sale in the bulletin, and they also remind us that the mitten tree will be sprouting up the first week of December. As we move into our time of worship, I acknowledge that the land on which we live and work and worship is Mi'kmaq, the unceded territory and uh, ancestral lands of the Mi'kmaq peoples. We seek to live with respect on this land and in peace and friendship with our neighbors uh, in the indigenous communities of Canada. And I welcome Nora now to come and light the Christ candle for us. That light is in us indeed. Let us rise and sing as we're instead. Our intro for God and help and ages Thank you. 
we can share together. So I invite us to pray. Eternal God, we gather as a people needing to remember the past. A people needing to affirm your presence in this present moment. A people needing to find hope for the future. We come to worship in a world that cries out for peace and not war. We come to be comforted by you in a world that yearns for hope and not despair. We come to find love and care in your presence, in the midst of the hatred and uncaring attitudes within us and around us. Guide our thoughts as we open ourselves to your peace, to your comfort, to your care. As we remember the past and all who sacrificed so much, we offer our gratitude for the liberties and peace and many blessings which are ours. As we think of what is going on in the world today, we offer our prayers for those who are presently offering themselves in the face of great conflicts and tyrannies, and for those whose lives are endangered and diminished by war. Speak your word to us, and into this troubled world, so that justice and peace may be achieved for all. In Jesus' name we pray. And as we move into this time of remembrance, I invite you to stand to sing our national anthem.
They shall not grow old, as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun, and in the morning, we will remember them. We will remember them. Please be seated. I want to just take a moment to remind us of the history of this act of remembrance. Of course, the Saturday is November the 11th, and back in 1918, at the end of what was called the Great War, the First World War, it was on November the 11th at 11 a.m., 1918, the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, that a peace treaty was signed that brought a temporary end to the fighting. It was called an armistice, and an armistice is a Latin word that means weapons stand still, or arms stand still. And from that time forth here in Canada, it was acknowledged and observed on the, November the 11th, a day to remember those who died, those who served, to remember the great cost of war. It was called Armistice Day. And as we come to this November this year, we're well aware that that hope of veterans that it would never happen again is not fulfilled, is not fulfilled. As war is happening again in our world as it has happened through the years, now in Ukraine and in the Middle East, it was in 1931 here in Canada that our federal government changed the name from Armistice Day to Remembrance Day to honor the will and intention of veterans who said that we need you to remember the great cost of war because lest we forget, it happens again. Part of our remembering is not just to honor the, and to pay tribute to those who served and sacrificed and gave so much, but it is to recommit ourselves to that hope of peace and justice for all in our world. We remember that war is a great tragedy, that it brings a great cost and loss of life, of future, of families, of homes and communities. And so today, in our remembering, we honor those who gave, but we also are called to recommit ourselves, to live in a way such that we are agents of peace, as followers of the Prince of Peace. Let us pray together. Eternal God, we are grateful today for those who died so that we could live, for those who endured pain so that we could know joy. For those who suffered imprisonment, that we might have freedom. We remember the devastations of war and the sacrifices of women and men, both past and in our present time. We are indeed thankful for the peace and the liberties which are ours in this country of Canada. And we remember all who have paid dearly so that we might enjoy just such a life. We open our hearts in thanksgiving for the lives of veterans and their families, for all who have given the supreme sacrifice of their lives, and for all who returned from the horrors of war forever changed. We honor the sacrifices made and the memory of all who died in war long ago and more recently. And we pray for the safety of those who serve in our Canadian forces, and for all who put their lives at risk for the sake of others. May our remembering the gifts of life and service bring us to a, a depth of gratitude for all that's been given. And may our remembering give honor to you. In the name of Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Amen. Carol is going to read a poem that is closely associated with time of remembrance. In Flanders fields the poppies grow, between the crosses row on row, that mark our place, and in the sky the larks, still bravely singing, fly, scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead, short days ago we lived, 
felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders fields. <clears throat> Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you from failing hands we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders fields. Remembrance is uh, Remembrance Day or Remembrance Week is it's a sad time in many ways because we remember sad things that happened a long time ago in wars and we know sad things are still happening today where people are fighting. But as you heard in that poem, it talks about the poppy. And I want to just take a minute before you go to Sunday school to make sure we all know why we wear poppies and where this tradition comes from. There was a doctor, his name was Dr. John McRae. He spelled his name just like Marie McRae does, the same way. He was from Guelph, Ontario. And in the time when the First World War happened, he went to help. He left his home here in Canada, and he went overseas. And he ended up in Belgium, and he was there when the soldiers were fighting, and he was practicing his his, his job as a doctor to try to help those who were injured. And back in um, 1915, his very close friend was killed in the war. His name was Alexis Helmer. And when Alexis Helmer had a very brief funeral over in Belgium, Dr. John McRae, who would also be known as Lieutenant John, Dr. John McRae, he sat down when, the day after his friend's funeral and death, and he wrote those words down. And where he was sitting, where all the white crosses were, where all the soldiers were buried, there were wild puppies growing in the field. And his thoughts and his sadness for the death of his friend and his sadness for the war, he wrote those words that you just heard. About seven months after that, in 19... Um, 16, those words were first published in England. And then a little while later in 1917, some of those words appeared on a poster here in Canada, which was a poster asking people to contribute to the war effort, to raise money to help with bringing back peace and freedom to people in the world. That poem has become very special, and it's because of that poem and Lieutenant Dr. John McCray, that we wear these poppies as a sign of remembrance. And it's a sad thing too, Dr. John McCray didn't get to know peace that came at the end of the war. Because before November of 1918, when the war ended, seven months or no, ten months before that, in January of 1918, he died of pneumonia and meningitis, still overseas. But his words are still with us. Poppy is to remember. Some of you might have seen this book in school. Yeah. When I was at the first church service this morning in Salt Springs, Chloe said, we read that book in school. But I want to take a moment, it's not very long, and I want to just help us all to identify the reason we wear the poppies. Once there was a long and terrible war, a war some call the Great War. Many young men went off to fight, and many did not return home to their families. But still, in the muddy fields where they fought, wild poppies sprang up, glowing brightly. An army doctor, weary from tending the wounded, wrote a poem about that war and about those poppies. The poem's here, but Carol's just read it. His poem was read far and wide. When the war finally ended on November 11, 1918, People everywhere celebrated the return to peace, and you can see the happiness on those faces. A poppy is to remember those far from home crossing troubled lands and threatening waters and dangerous skies. It is for the wounded and for those who took care of them. It is for the dead and those who carried on without 
It is for the brave ones who remain and their memories of battle. A poppy is for peace. Every year on Remembrance Day, it blooms across our land just as it blooms here today on us. A poppy is to remember. Can you say a prayer with me? Dear God, war is a terrible thing. We remember the wars in the past and that wars are happening today. We know you want peace for the world. And sometimes it happens at a great cost. With our poppies, we remember those who gave so much. And we still hope and pray for peace. This morning, this morning, the scripture reading, and this morning, first scripture reading is from James chapter 3, verses 13 to 18. A harvest of justice is sown in peace for those who make peace. Who is wise and understanding among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness or wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be boastful and false to the truth. Such wisdom does not come from God, but is earthly, unspiritual, and devilish. For, there, for where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from God is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And a harvest of justice is sown in peace for those who make peace. And the second reading is from Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9 through 13. You remember our labor and toil, brothers and sisters, and how we worked night and day, so that we might not burden any of you while we proclaimed to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how pure, upright, and blameless our conduct was towards you believers. As you know, we dealt with each one of you like a father with his children, urging and encouraging you and pleading that you should lead a little, that you should lead a life worthy of God, who calls you into God's own kingdom and glory. We also constantly give thanks to God for this. That when you receive the word of God, that you heard from us, you accepted it, not as a human word, but as what it really is, God's word, which is also at work in you believers.
Some of our parents, perhaps, or our grandparents, our uncles or aunts, or great uncles or great aunts, might have experienced what war is like, but I don't think any of us have lived through it, have we? At least not in the presence of our country being at war. But even now, we witness the destruction of war and the deaths of people, both soldiers and civilians, through news reports and social media images that come to us from Ukraine and from Israel and from Gaza. War is both past and yet present. It is far away in terms of distance, and yet it's so close at hand. We've learned over the last, what, 50 or so years that we live in a global community now. And war has left a long shadow over this world, and that shadow seems to be deepening with the reality of war today. So with Sunday services of worship and school assemblies and cenotaph rituals, this week we pause to remember history. We pause to remember those who gave so much for the sake of a better day, for all, some of whom gave their very lives in past wars. And as we do so each year, we claim again our hope, our hope for a future for all God's children, that we and they will live in liberty and peace in a world which, of course, we trust and know God's intention is for justice and liberty, for wholeness and peace. And as wars are waged right now in our world, we have to grieve. Grieve that that vision and that hope is yet unfulfilled. Even as we enjoy peace today to come to worship, we know that others, brothers and sisters in this, in this earth, do not have the same freedoms, but experience the realities, the terrible realities of war. You know, it will be 105 years ago this Saturday that the great armistice was signed at the end of the First War. And those veterans, of course, are all gone now. All of the veterans of the First Great War. And so are their stories gone with them. But there are still a few veterans who served their God and country in the Second Great War. And there are those who have served as members in the Canadian Armed Forces and the forces of other countries in wars that have occurred since. And they yet tell their stories, sometimes with pride, but often with great pain. They help us not to forget. They and those veterans who went before implore us not to forget. For their hope, their great hope, was that in remembering the horror that was war, that is war, and what it cost humanity in terms of people killed, in terms of people injured and maimed physically and psychologically, in terms of communities destroyed, and in terms of economic resources on such a mega scale, used for destructive purposes, which when you think about it, could be used for constructive purposes, to feed the hungry and house the homeless, and to care for the sick and to make lives better. The hope of veterans was that in remembering the hardship, the horrors of war, that people would work toward finding other means to solving conflicts and bridging differences, ways which, not did, which would not exact such a cost to humanity and to this earth. It was the great hope of many men and women in generations past who gave so greatly by serving through war that nation would not go to war against nation again. Two weeks ago we heard those words from the prophet Isaiah on peace Sabbath. It was their hope that nations would not 
commit injustices and oppress other peoples, and that people would be able to experience freedom and live their lives out fully with a lasting and flourishing peace. The service of veterans who fought and died and those who return call us each year at this time not only to remember the past, but to rededicate ourselves to their great hope. God's will and intention for this world as is revealed in the sacred writings of our faith and in the writings of other faith traditions as well, we believe God's will and intention is for harmony and for justice and for freedom and peace. The shalom that just two weeks ago we spoke about on peace time. And although we may feel powerless in stopping wars, as I feel these days, we do have a role to play in God's intentions and in bringing them about. We have a role to play through our own attitudes and our actions and our relationships. From the writer of a letter in the scripture with whom I share a name, we have heard the message today. It is you who are instructed to put away bitterness and jealousy and to look for ways of harmony and unity. It is you who are called to act in ways that are peaceful and gentle and friendly. It is you who are called to find God in your lives and to share God's love with others. And James says, when we do these things, the harvest that we will reap will be one of justice and of peace. And in his letter to the Thessalonians, the Apostle Paul asked the members of the Christian community there in Thessalonica, he begins, if you note it, Jack said, remember. That's what we're doing this week. Remembering? Paul asked the people in that community to remember, to remember something other than what we're remembering. But he said, remember when I came with Sylvanus and Timothy and spent time with you how we found a way to support ourselves, to not be a burden upon you. We didn't want to place expectations on you to provide for us, he says, but we worked hard to feed and clothe and shelter ourselves. Paul says, remember, our intentions were good. Our intentions were pure as we came to share the gospel with you. We didn't come among you expecting you to look after us. We didn't want to be a burden on you. But we tried to support ourselves. We often hear how Paul had a tent-making ministry. He was a missionary in sense, or one bringing the good news, but he also sewed together canvas tents, apparently, as a means of support, so that he didn't have to reach into the offering plate for the work that the people were doing in Christ's name to support himself, for them to support themselves. And in that passage, he says, as you remember that we didn't ask that of you, but we did ask this of you, to lead lives worthy of God. And as followers of Jesus, we today yet are called to live lives worthy of God. Today I want to tell you two stories of people who I think tried their utmost best in the midst of difficult circumstances to do just that, to lead lives worthy of God. One of these stories comes from the First World War, and the second from the Great War that followed it, called the Second War. Do you know the name Edith Cavell? There's a nurse down there shaking her head. Some of you might know that name, but you know, that's why it's important for us to remember the stories of the past and the real people of the past. During World War I, Edith Cavell was an English nurse who worked tirelessly in Europe helping refugees escape to allied countries. Day after day, she risked her own life to see that others could escape into safety. And she is celebrated for treating soldiers who were wounded, get this, on both sides of the war. Not just her own soldiers from the Allied troops, but also treating soldiers from the German side. She is celebrated for covertly helping over 200 Allied soldiers escape from German-occupied Belgium, soldiers who returned, not home, but back into active service when she helped them escape. In the wartime, that was a, an offense punishable by the death penalty under German military law. 
Edith Cavell was arrested in Brussels, and she was court-martialed for that offense, war treason. She was found guilty, and she was sentenced to death by firing squad. On October 12, 1915, she was executed. But before she died, in fact, the night before her execution, she said these words. Standing as I do in view of God and of eternity, I realize that patriotism is not enough. I must have no bitterness or hatred toward him. Those words were later inscribed on a memorial near Trafalgar Square in London. Raised within the Church of England as a devout Christian, her strong Christian beliefs propelled Edith Cavell to help those who needed it. It didn't matter what side they were on. If they were wounded, she nursed them. If they were wounded, she helped them. And she was quoted as saying, I can't stop while there are lives that need to be saved. Standing as I do in view of God and of eternity, I realize that patriotism is not enough. I must have no bitterness or hatred toward anyone. We need to remember Edith Cavell and her words. Whenever we are tempted to hold hatred in our hearts or bitterness toward another person or to see someone as our enemy, we need to remember the words of Edith Cavell. She knew that the world would not be changed so long as there was hatred in people's hearts. And even sentenced to death, she believed that. She knew that patriotism would never be enough to make for peace. The second story comes from the Second World War, and you may know this story, it's well known. It comes from the horrors of war that occurred in the small city of Coventry, England. During that war, one of the great horrors was the firebombing of cities during the conflict. And one of those cities which received the deluge of bombs was the small city of Coventry. One night, and this is astronomical to think about, one night in 1941, 14,000 people were killed in Coventry from the firebombing. The city was virtually wiped off the map, and among the buildings destroyed was their beloved Coventry Cathedral built in the 15th century. They tried hard, the people that night, to save their place of worship, their place of God. But by dawn, all that remained were three outside stone walls and the tower. The next day, as people came to see those that survived, they wept bitterly, history says, at this senseless loss. But then some of those people did something quite amazing. An act of faith, really. Some of the villagers took some of the blackened stone and they carried them to what had been the front of that sanctuary, of that cathedral, and they piled them on top of each other to create a makeshift altar. And then some of them took two of the big beams that had fallen, charred beams from the roof of the cathedral, and they formed them into a cross and stood it up. And then someone took a piece of charcoal wood and they wrote on the wall two words, Father, forgive. Father, forgive. Even in the aftermath of that devastation and loss, at least someone did not have vengeance at heart, but forgiveness, and the reconciliation. They knew that patriotism was not enough. They knew that they must not hold any hatred or bitterness toward anyone if they were to have the spirit of Christ in them. Most recently, we have seen vengeance as the result. Admittedly, it is so hard not to fall into seeking retaliation when harm is visited upon us, either individually or as a country. It's easier to strike out in vengeance, for sure, than it is to seek reconciliation by looking at the eyes of another and saying, you're just like me. Even though you may have a different nationality, come from a different country, be a different religion, or a different skin color, vengeance is easy. 
it's much harder to seek to understand another, to work out our differences, seeking to listen, to understand, to treat each other with respect and not harm. But that's what it takes for peace. As we look over history, we see that so many wars have been caused by what? Religion. Religious differences. Where we think that God is with us and not with them because they're different. Come from a different land or have a different speech or a different color or a different way of honoring God. Wars are so often caused by religion, and that's a sickening irony, really. But for other reasons, too, by greed or by bitterness for the past or by unjust use of power where one nation, as we are seeing now, tries to assume another nation. And yet the call is for us to lead lives worthy of God. God who desires peace and harmony and justice and freedom and right relations. This week we remember again that the hope of Canadian veterans was that by remembering the huge cost of war, it would never happen again. The call of the Legion, lest we forget, lest we forget. The hope that such a cost would not be visited upon humanity, the cost of so many young lives, the cost of the loss of homes and communities. And remembering that so many people died and were denied a full and abundant life, their hope was that it would not occur, and yet it still is occurring. And that's the why our remembering is so important. Not just to pay tribute to those who gave in the past, but to touch again our own hope of how we are called to live and how we are called to seek justice and peace. Let us recommit ourselves this year to lead lives worthy of God and let there indeed be peace on earth. And you remember how that song goes? Let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. How we treat each other does make a difference in the world. Amen. Let's sing together now, Weep for the Dead, which is number 526, Voices United, and we'll omit verse 3.
And then it finishes. Compassion into action. There is one thing that will never fail us. Compassion. Acts of compassion, both big and small, give rise to peace. We can't wave a magic wand and bring about peace in the world. But with every act of compassion, we harness the power of love. The same love that Jesus lived and died for, and that he promised would move mountains. At a time when it feels like there's a new crisis confronting us each and every day, it's reassuring to know that Minute Mission and Service Partners provide real-time relief around the world on a daily basis. That's why your generosity matters so much. The food security initiatives, refugee support work, educational programs, and emergency and advocacy efforts, your gifts through mission and service support, aren't just about food, safety, education, and human rights. They are ultimately about compassion, peace, and hope. And in a world where division tears the fabric that binds us together, that's everything. Jesus put compassion into action every day he lived. He brought hope into every room he walked into. He was literally the calm in the storm. He stretched out his arms in the ultimate sacrifice of love. The world has never the same. Every act of compassion contributes to a more peaceful world. Thank you for your generosity through mission and service. Your gifts truly do help move mountains. Thank you, Anne. I invite you to join in prayer. God, whose great desire we believe is peace that comes with justice, and whose compassion was revealed so fully in Jesus, we unite our hearts now to pray. And we give thanks for the gifts of goodness and grace which have come so freely to us in our lives, for strength in the face of circumstances that weary us, for courage to speak out and act for what we know to be right and true according to Christ's gospel, and for a sense of care and community as we experience here in this community of faith, community that embodies compassion. All these we acknowledge, O oh God, are gifts of your grace, and we are thankful. And as we come again to this time of remembrance this week, we think of people around the world who fear the violence of war as troops are deployed and bombs are dropped and missiles are launched and attack rockets released. In the midst of the fear and anxiety that is felt by people in Ukraine and Israel and Gaza and neighboring lands, may your sustaining power be a source of light in the darkness. The stories of war are again shared in November days. We think of people who have served their country and who sought to bring stability and peace to the world, even as they had to respond to an invitation to participate in battle. And as war dominates the news and is splashed across our televisions and newspaper headlines and social media feeds, may we know again that the essence of life is to be found in following the path of one who was called Prince of Peace. So redirect us, O oh God, and guide us. Redirect and guide the leaders of nations onto those paths. Gratefully again this year, we remember men and women who have yearned and struggled for justice and peace. We remember those who died, those who were seriously injured in that pursuit. We remember, thankfully, the veterans who've given of themselves for the sake of liberty and justice. And we remember those whose peace is shattered today by the current wars in Ukraine and Israel and Gaza. And we remember in prayer those closer to home whose peace is shattered by tragedies, by illness, by discouragement, 
by loss. We uphold and concern those who are in hospital, those who are cared for in nursing homes, those who have no home at all and have to live on the streets or in tents or find a place of warmth in a community shelter. God, we pray for all who are struggling in these days. And we pray for our neighbors in the Durham and Salem congregations of the West River Presbyterian Gospel Church, with the people of the Pictou County Council of Churches. We pray that Christ's love will continue to be shared through their ministry. God, we know that it's a double-edged nature, our remembering. We acknowledge the ultimate evils of war, and yet we remember with very real gratitude those who sacrifice their health and their lives in order to combat evil. They struggled as best they could. Be with us, O oh God, as we remember. And use us and the offerings that we give this day, dedicating them to the work of your church in order to shine Christ's light where there is darkness, to establish justice where it's absent, and to create peace where it's lacking. As Jesus taught his disciples a long time ago, so we join also to pray today. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Our closing hymn is a prayer. O day of God, draw nigh. It's number 688 in Voices United. And to quote from the Desiderata by Max Erwin, as far as possible, as much as it depends on you, be on good terms with all persons. And may the God of justice guide you in the paths of peace. May the Christ of liberation reveal to you the ways of new life. And may the Holy Spirit awaken in you the desire to work for harmony today and every day.
that kind of tree. <laughs> so the board of managers talked about this idea, and they referred it to the board of trustees. And now a tree has been planted, thanks to Evan and Jeff, a gift to our church, courtesy of Tom Matheson. You've likely heard the saying, the best time to plant a tree is? Anytime. 30, I read. <laughs> the best time to plant a tree is 30 years ago. <laughs> but the second best time to plant a tree is? Now. now. Right? So that's what we've done. That's what we're doing. We gather around this beautiful little tree today to celebrate the fact of things. In the Bible, trees are symbols of life and healing. From the very beginning of Genesis, with the tree in the Garden of Eden, to the book of Revelation with the tree that brings healing to the nation. So we're going to honor the planting of this new tree here at Scottsburg United Church. It's our sacred act and our intention, a way of showing respect for the earth and renewing the earth. So let us pray in a dedication. Creating God whose goodness is revealed in the life of this good earth and in all that grows. This tree is planted here with our gratitude and with our hope. May it take root in this soil, drawing from it water and nutrients so it may grow tall and strong, so that it may flourish, bringing beauty to our churchyard, offering shelter to birds to make this place with its presence in it. And as it grows through the years, may we be attentive to that growth, and may one day some of us see it adorned with Christmas lights to shine in the darkness of early winter in memory and in celebration of loved ones. Dedicate this little tree today with the hope that it will grow to its full potential, which we know is your hope for us and for all creation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.